with you tonight. Uh, I'm also representing the Clarkson Early Learning Task Force, which was appointed by the city of Clarkson not too long ago to begin to look at early learning and literacy needs uh, uh, and plans for the Clarkson community through the lens of equity. And so we're really excited to be a co-sponsor of this workshop this evening. Uh, as a lot mentioned, this is the continuation. We hope it will be a conversation. And um, we started this whole work because we began to realize as we were meeting with the task force that we didn't know very much about young children and COVID-19. And we knew that there were others out there that may have the same feeling. So we reached out to our colleagues at Georgia State University and the Prevent Prevention Resource Center and said, what if we got together and did a webinar and we ask pediatricians and others in the know <clears throat> to really give us what they knew about young children and COVID-19 and what we still don't know. And then we also wanted to know what our child care partners were doing in the wake of this pandemic. And very importantly, we wanted to know what families were experiencing, feeling, thinking about, and wanting to know. And so we invited some of our colleagues who work directly with families to join us this evening. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce a, a new friend and a new colleague, Ashley Owen Smith, who has done so much to put together the content for the webinar tonight. So Ashley, take it away. Thank you, Roberta. It's great to be here with all of you and thank you for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> as Roberta mentioned, she and I have been working on the, these webinars um, and I hope they'll be useful. I am an assistant professor in the GSU School of Public Health and working with the Prevention Resource Research Center at Georgia State that's focused on addressing social determinants of health um, in Clarkston. So, we hope that this will be one of many activities for the community. Next slide. Um, so our agenda for today's webinar, um, the first panelist we have is Dr. Lori Bowden, who's a pediatrician with Ethne Health. Some of you may be familiar with that wonderful clinic in um, our Clarkston community. Um, and what we're gonna do is present and discuss a flip book, a, a resource document that we put together to distribute to the community specifically about children and COVID-19. So I'm gonna show all of you that flip book and we'll walk through it together with Dr. Bowden so that she can provide additional commentary, um, additional content as, as needed. Um, our second panelist is Nadia, who's a parent educator for New American Pathways. Um, and Roberta will be facilitating that conversation with Nadia, um, specifically talking about what families are asking and what they are experiencing. And our third panelist are Alexandra and David, um, and uh, Roberta will also be moderating that conversation. They are with the Giselle Learning Academy and are going to talk about experiences from a child care center's perspective, what they've been doing, um, their plans, how they're handling COVID, um, and, and dealing with all of the overwhelming, often overwhelming um, expectations and recommendations around child care. Um, and then we will hopefully have time for some participant conversation. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so Roberta and I will hopefully be able to save some time for that and facilitate. Um, as Awit mentioned, feel free to enter any questions or comments in the chat as well. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I'm going to show everyone this resource book that Roberta and I developed in collaboration with folks from the Georgia State University Prevention Research Center and CDF Action, as well as the Adult Learning uh, Literacy Research Center. And what I'd like to do is walk through each page, present the content, and then provide Dr. Bowden with an opportunity to add any information that she thinks is important. Um, so again, if you have any questions or comments as we go through the resource, um, please feel free to jot it down um, or ask it later or write it in the chat box. 
So one of the first questions, um, certainly that we have heard quite a bit about is, you know, what is the chance that my child or a child that I care for will get sick with COVID-19? Um, certainly it's important to emphasize that children can get the virus um, and that they can give the virus to adults and adults can give the virus to children. However, our, our research is suggesting that children represent a smaller share of cases, um, which is indicating that they may be less likely to get COVID-19 compared to older people. Uh, Dr. Bowden, I was hoping that you could comment a little bit on um, the new Centers for Disease Control report that just came out about COVID among children. I know we're learning more and more every day about COVID specifically with little ones, so under the age of five. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add to our understanding about COVID and, and the, the risk of illness among little ones? Yes, <clears throat> I think um, it definitely has, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of research, a lot of different things coming out about young children with COVID and uh, most recently, I know there was the South Korean study that um, showed that the young children, um, they may not actually um, um, spread it as much as in the up to age 10 year old um, group, but the 10 to 19 year old group could spread COVID as much as adults do. Um, the, there's also the study about the possibility that the young children may um, Did we lose Dr. Bowden? Spread to yeah. others um, because we've seen so often that children are not the first case in their home to get COVID-19. They usually get it from an adult or an older person in their household. Great, thank you. That's helpful to, to understand. Um, next slide, please, Linda. So another question that we've heard a lot about is um, are, is related to concerns about children who have other health problems. And, you know, is there, are these children at higher risk uh, for COVID compared to children without other health problems? Um, so we don't know yet if children with other health problems have a bigger chance of getting sick with COVID. I've seen some data that suggests that the children who have more serious illness and have been hospitalized and the very small number who've died are, are oftentimes have been children with other health problems, but we have a lot left to learn about this. Um, so Dr. Bowden, could you weigh in here about any important considerations uh, for families or other people who are taking care of children who do have other health conditions or have special needs? Are there things that those families or care providers need to be thinking about? Yes. Um, so. In the Children's Health Care of Atlanta, the admissions there um, throughout this year, they have noted that the number of children who have been admitted there, um, that they do tend to have an underlying condition, such as asthma or obesity, sickle cell anemia, or cancer. Um, so especially um, the kids um, with asthma as we are, um, they, well, especially those with asthma really should be checking in with their doctors to make sure that they're under good control, um, especially as we get into the fall with the flu season coming. Um, it's gonna be really important for them to be very well under control and then obviously the um, children such as the ones that have been admitted to CHOA that have um, sickle cell disease and obviously cancer, um, children with, with obesity, really to do what they can to optimize their health. Thank you. Next slide. 
So overall, our data seem to suggest that the majority of cases are mild or even asymptomatic um, and that a smaller number, so I've seen statistics about 15% have severe infection requiring oxygen, for example, and 5% are critical, um, which may require ventilation, for example. Um, some reports um, that have come out recently have suggested that potentially as many as 40% of cases are people who are asymptomatic. Um, however, those individuals can still spread the virus. Um, and in fact, some data suggests that in fact, people can be most infectious the day before they develop active symptoms. So um, this is, I think, an important point for us to all understand is um, that we can't know whether someone has COVID-19 um, if there are no symptoms present, because there are a significant number of people who do have the virus but are asymptomatic, meaning they are not showing any symptoms of the virus. Um, and that's why our recommendations here are that it is important to wear a face covering and stay six feet apart from people when you're leaving your house. Next slide. So um, this is a, a question that has come up a lot, both in my personal and professional interactions. What to do if someone in your home or in your immediate community has symptoms? Um, and so we have some recommendations here about um, you know, making sure that if you're caring for a child, to have someone else care for the child if you're sick. Um, and if that's not possible, everyone should be wearing face coverings, um, washing hands frequently, um, and keeping the, the house clean as possible, um, and then monitoring children for symptoms that could emerge, and certainly calling the doctor if you are, or a child that you're caring for is sick. Um, so Dr. Bowden, in light of all of these recommendations, I'm wondering if you um, might have any other recommendations in terms of what families should do if someone in the home has symptoms um, or is sick. Um, you know, I know as a side note, some, some people that I've spoken with are really nervous about going to the doctor um, because they feel like it might expose them to, to COVID or other things or really worried about going to the emergency room. So what would you advise families and caregivers of, of children to do in this situation? So if, if a child is sick, especially if they know someone else in their household already has COVID-19, it probably is not necessary for them to get tested. So they would not really have to go to the doctor unless they are having more severe symptoms and shortness of breath and persistent cough, those things. Um, and I did want to highlight on this slide that, that the kids, they could just have something as simple as a stuffy or a runny nose, um, which is so common in kids, but um, that could be the only sign of them having COVID-19. Um, and then just from the doctor's standpoint, you know, we, we are working to keep our offices clean and to keep well and sick children separate. Um, and well and sick patients separate. Um, and so we definitely encourage children to get their immunizations and to get their checkups um, as they need to for school. Um, but you've outlined it real well on that page, the things that are most important. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, um, interesting is probably not the word, right word, but it's frustrating probably for many families that um, the symptoms of COVID, especially in little ones, um, are, their symptoms are so similar <laughs> to other conditions that kids get all the time. I mean, I have a toddler in daycare, and it's when he was in daycare, he's not now. Um, you know, it was not uncommon that he had a runny nose or a cough or um, sneezes and even a fever now and again. And it's just hard for families to... Um, to judge when it's just a cold and when it's something more serious. Right, exactly. And, and it may end up completely being like just a cold in a child, um, but 
just being aware that, you know, if, if someone else in the household has COVID-19 and the child develops any of those cold symptoms, they probably have it as well. Thank you. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so wearing a face mask or a face covering, um, should children wear them? Um, so the recommendations are that if your child is two years of age or older, he or she should wear a face mask in public just like families and just like parents or other adults are doing. Um, it's important to highlight that children under the age of two should not wear a face mask, um, as well as children who have, may have difficulty removing the mask. So children who have other disabilities, for example. Um, so that's just an important caveat. Um, and that masks should be worn in public spaces where your child is likely to come within six feet of another person. So grocery stores, any other kind of more crowded places. Um, if you're at home or you're somewhere where you can stay six feet apart from other people. So you're in a, a kind of open park area or going for a hike and pe other people are not around. Um, you do not need to wear a face mask um, if you can maintain that distance. Um, so, you know, Dr. Bowden, I know this came up a little bit on our previous webinar, um, and Dr. Arenas helped us understand this a little bit. I wonder if we could revisit this topic of how we can get children to wear a face mask. I know many of us who are parents of little ones um, are very challenged by trying to get little ones to keep it on. So I wonder if you could share any suggestions or tips with us. Yeah, I think what the idea she shared the last time about getting the cool masks that have all the cool action heroes or the princesses or whatever they have on them that will make the child be more likely to wear it um, and make sure it's a good mask. One thing that I see all the time is people messing with the outside of their mask and that can introduce infection to you. So this is for adults and children, not get a good mask that fits around your nose well and, and fits around your ears well so that you're not having to pull it up and move it around all day long. Um, and then for the children, you know, putting masks on their stuffed animals and on their dolls and those kind of things, drawing pictures with masks on, on the pictures you draw may help the child to see it as a more normal thing. And then wearing for the adults to wear a mask some around the home so that the child can see this is normal, it's not scary, it's part of what we do these days, so. Yeah, I know um, anecdotally we've heard a few stories about children in childcare centers um, admiring cool masks of another child and then wanting to share and like trade masks. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly that's another potential <laughs> problem in terms of, um, you know, being counterproductive. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide, Linda. Okay, so this issue about can family and relatives, loved ones, um, hug and, and kiss my child, this is a really hard time when we are, many of us are feeling very socially isolated and, and want family time um, and affection. Um, so this is a really, a really challenging thing. And, um, you know, the recommendations are that, you know, if, if families or relatives, um, you know, aren't living in the home, that the child should maintain that social distancing six feet away. Um, and if you do have people um, who are going to be coming into contact with you or your child, again, wearing a face mask, washing hands or using hand sanitizer before touching your child. Um, and, you know, I think a, a related question that has come up that I, I wanted you to weigh in on, Dr. Bowden, was this issue about whether grandparents and other relatives can come visit. So kind of similar question. Um, you know, how can families kind of manage this social isolation, wanting their children to still see grandparents and other important family members during this time, not keeping them separated for however many more months this is going to, to go on. Do you have any other 
thoughts or recommendations about how families and, and other people who care for children can negotiate this tough situation? The only other thing I would add to what you have on the slide is um, possibly to meet outside um, where it's less likely, where the germs will be more likely to be blown away, um, but still wear mask. Um, but it's, it's difficult and um, the recommendations on the slide are good. <laughs> yeah. so. No, meeting outside is a great addition. Um, certainly much safer, thank you. Um, okay, next slide. So this is a, a question that I continue to struggle with personally with childcare for my child. Um, is it safe, you know? And there's really, unfortunately, no clear answer to this question. It's so, it depends on so many things. Um, some of us need childcare so that we can go to work. Um, some, some of us don't have people at home to watch our child. Um, and, and so this is a, a, a decision that each family needs to make and weigh the, the benefits and risks um, given their circumstances. Um, so Dr. Bowden, I'm just wondering if, you know, you might comment on this decision process for families, some of the things that people may want to consider when they're weighing the benefits and risks of this really difficult decision. Yes, I, th I think um, just seeing what um, things that the daycare centers have in place for keeping the, all the um, surfaces clean and keeping everything clean, what, what they have in place for keeping children separate from each other, and how, how big of the, are the groups of children that are together, um, and having those screenings, having multiple ways of screening by the questionnaires at the beginning of the day, and um, also just keeping the cleanliness of the center itself can be some helpful things. But it, it I understand it's tough trying to navigate that. Um, and I feel like a lot of these learning centers are doing a good job with um, trying to keep their uh, facilities as safe as they can for the kids. We'll, we'll revisit a, a conversation, this conversation later and our subsequent panelists um, from Giselle um, who can talk a little bit about what they're doing to keep children safe and I know they're, they're doing a lot so um, we can continue that conversation in a minute. Okay, next slide. Okay, so you know, can my children go outside? Can they play with other children who live in my apartment complex or in my neighborhood? Um, again, the, the recommendations are to avoid other children who are outside of your home. If people are, if children are playing together, trying to maintain that six feet social distance, um, you know, really not having play dates with children from other homes as hard as that is right now. Um, if you do have those kinds of interactions, again, going back to Dr. Bowden's point earlier about family members, you know, having gatherings outdoors is a less risky um, decision. Again, wearing face masks if children um, are over the age of two, um, making sure they're not sharing face masks um, with one another. And then again, good hand hygiene. Um, you know, Dr. Bowden, and I, we had a little bit of a conversation in our first webinar about swimming pools that came up. Um, and so I'm just wondering about, you know, what are some other activities that families and people who are taking care of children might consider? Um, you know, can, can families and caregivers take children to the park? Um, can they go to the swimming pool? Um, any, any thoughts about, um, you know, how as families and people who take care of children, how we can engage children, um, you know, keep them active while also keeping them safe, it's hard. Yes, um, I think parks, at least where they can be outside and run and just, um, you know, the, a lot of the parks may still be closed as far as swing sets and climbing things, which, uh, they don't get cleaned anyway, so, um, but being able to run around and um, 
there are plenty of neighborhoods where children are walking around with their parents. So many neighborhoods have gotten very creative and had scavenger hunts and things like that to help keep kids engaged and to keep them interested in being outside. Um, learning new skills, you know, how to kick a ball, how to play soccer, how to play baseball, how to ride your bike, you know, all those things are good for the kids um, to be outside and having nature hunts, so many things. Um, and the CDC originally, I think, has said that the pools are safe, um, that like, that, or that you do not spread necessarily um, COVID-19 through pools, but I personally don't quite understand how that can be um, uh, because viruses like adenovirus spread through pools. But anyway, I personally would probably not be real thrilled about lots of children being at pools all the time. Um, and, um, but I think there are plenty of other ways to get active and get outside and be outside your home or where you live have to be creative. Yes. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, so questions about public transportation. Generally, again, it's not um, ideal um, to take children on public buses, trains, taxis. Um, certainly, many of us, um, because of childcare um, constraints and, and work demands, um, may need to do this. Uh, and so, again, wearing face masks trying to social distance, um, using, you know, hand sanitizer, trying not to touch surfaces, um, keeping your hands away from your face, you know, avoiding touching your face, um, and again, face masks. Um, and, you know, I think a related question that's come up several times um, is about traveling. You know, I think the summer is winding down now and kids are kind of going back to school in the hybrid or, or remote learning models. Um, but families I know are wondering about whether they can travel um, right now. So I don't know if, if you have any comment about that um, and how that may or may not be different from these other recommendations with respect to public transportation. Um, travel is for the most part um, not encouraged um, with children, uh, but it might be possible to take a day trip where you're going to a park to go hike or go do something that's outside. There again, outside is key. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, if it, you know, it could be the beach and be outside, if, if, but um, there is more risk the more you travel. Um, okay, just have a few more minutes. Um, Linda, next slide and we'll wrap up. Um, so Dr. Bowden, you alluded to this earlier, and I think it certainly bears repeating um, questions about, you know, should I continue to take my child or, or child children that I care for, for well child visits? Um, and Susan, you addressed this in our first webinar. Um, and, you know, the, the recommendations, as I understand them, are that absolutely it is critical that children stay on their immunization schedule um, and that you know they can wear face mask if they're two or older you know trying to social distance when you go to the ch to the doctor um, and you mentioned that you know most doctors offices are, are separating sick children from well children so I know you know many clinics are doing a really good job at making sure that children are safe when they come in for well-child visits. Um, so are there any other important factors that you want to mention with respect to routine well-child visits in this context? Um, I do emphasize getting the immunizations because if a child, a young child under age two does not get their immunizations, if they get COVID or if they get flu, um, they might not be immunized against some of the bacteria that can cause more problems on top of COVID-19 or the flu. So that is very important. And also just to emphasize the importance of children, especially this year, getting their flu vaccine um, because uh, it's going to be difficult to navigate COVID-19 with the flu this year. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, and then I think our last slide 
is about children getting tested for COVID. Um, this has come up a lot in um, some of my both personal and professional conversations. Um, you know, should if you feel like your child has symptoms of COVID, should you take your child to get tested? So Dr. Bowden, any thoughts about what might be some factors to consider um, when making that decision? Yes, so really, as I stated before, they don't really need to get tested, especially if they know that someone else in their household has a confirmed case of COVID-19. Um, in some situations where they're in, where some of the kids who are going to in-person school, they may need, or even the daycare in the preschool age group, they may need to be tested to know whether in, they can go back to the school um, or at what point they would need to go back to the school or to the daycare. Um, and really in the younger age group, I mean, that would be, those would be the main things I can think of. Um, you know, even if it's somebody with an underlying condition, if they get sicker, then they will definitely be. So, um, those would be my main recommendations with that, that overall they would not have to be tested. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Linda, the next slide, um, just I want to pause on this slide for just a minute and then I'm going to turn it over to Roberta. All right, next slide, Linda. Okay, well, we'll pause on this slide while uh, maybe uh, Linda stepped away. Um, the what I was planning on doing was having a brief opportunity for folks um, to um, provide any feedback that they have about the flip book. Um, but I think what we need to do at this point is go ahead and turn things over to um, Roberta, who is going to have a conversation with Nadia from New American Pathways. And then if we have time at the end, we will come back to um, a, an additional discussion about the content we've covered thus far. So I'll turn it over to you, Roberta. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to echo that we definitely want to take time at the very end to get your feedback on the flip book, which I think is really exciting, and um, to see how we might make it even better and how we might disseminate it. So welcome, Nadia. We're really glad that you are here with us tonight. And um, wanted to say that i um, really glad that you've taken the time to do this. Um, and we'd like to ask you first to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey everyone, um, my name is Nadia Mwangachuchu. I am a parent educator. I work with New American Pathways, a refugee resettlement agency. I am um, been working with them for five years now serving refugee families. I am also a student in a nursing program at Georgia State and also a very proud mother of three myself. Thank you. So thank you very much for um, sharing that. We think it's really important as we learn about what, what we know about COVID-19 and what we don't know to also hear from parents and the parent voices. So you do both. You actually work with parents and you are a parent. Yes. So we're, <laughs> we're going to ask you some questions about the parent's point of view. So yes. tell us a little bit about um, what you do um, as a parent educator with parents as teachers. What is that and what is home visiting and how do you get to know your parents? So I think I'll just talk about the program overall itself. Parents as Teacher is a program that builds a strong community by thriving family that are healthy and safe and ready to learn by um, matching them with trained professionals who uh, will do regular home visits in the earliest life of a child from uh, prenatal to kindergarten so that all children can be able to learn growth and also realize their full potential. So that's basically what I do. Uh, just that's the overall of the program and what they do. But what we usually focus on is um, what we call a ch um, parent child interruption, which is more uh, of creating uh, learning activities where we bring within a home uh, with the parents 
and also be able to uh, cover up what we call uh, developmental central parenting, which also covers the attachment of a mother, um, discipline and nutrition, safety and transition. And at least not last, also covers um, the well-being of the family, where we have to actually know uh, the well-being of the uh, cover the educational, the employ employment, um, basic needs of the family, how to connect them to the resources they actually need. And that's basically much of, of what parents as teachers do. So you really go visit them in their homes, which you did before the pandemic. Yes. And, um, there are several home visiting programs in that serve clerks and residents. There, are, yes. a lot of people don't know about them because they don't see you. You're mainly in people's we homes. We always, we are always on the field. Um, parents and, and, <laughs> and sort of role modeling different um, activities with them and helping them do some screening as well. Yes. Um, we are, are pretty excited. There's going to be a new home visiting program coming pretty soon that maybe we'll do another webinar on called Safe Care. Uh, oh, great. That's great to hear. Right. Um, but of course, now you're not visiting families because of COVID-19. How are you connecting with them and, and how are you sharing information with them about uh, the virus? The way we connect, we use is uh, technology because of course everyone is doing uh, virtual learning these days. We use what we call WebEx where we would be able to see the families and share uh, the information, share the resources uh, that is in the round uh, question they have, especially about child care, schools, and everything around how to reach out for any uh, resources they need for like housing and, and how to get in food pantries and stuff like that. So we usually will use WebEx um, to connect with them. And also for those who are not able to um, use this technology, we keep um, doing the home visit on the phone. And this is 24 hour phone open line because we know, as you know, all the mothers are going through chaotic right now, that they are getting ready for school, the child care, all those questions they have. So we have to make sure that uh, our parents are safe, our parents are ready, and they are aware of what is actually going on and I'll be able to answer their questions. So we're still doing um, our regular home visits and be able to answer the questions. In a new have. way, in, in, in a new normal, as we say, right? Yeah, in a normal way. And then actually, it is actually became so more sufficient than just um, anything, just because these questions all over and in, and the parents are the ones have them and you, you want to be able to actually answer them. So you have to be able to still be in touch with them. So we, so you have to be very knowledgeable about COVID-19. Yes, we um, so will also help in the book that will help also. Um, mm -hmm. So how are our families dealing with physical distancing, wearing masks, using hand sanitizer, sanitizer, trying to keep people? So just like, to make sure that just to make sure that our parents understand and know what it is, much of them, they don't really understand about social distancing and we, but every home visit that we do, we make sure that we touch base on every, everything about COVID-19, especially so how about- are they doing? How are they doing? What are families telling you? They ask more about the family asking, what they're asking about is more of, of how safe are our children going to be in child care? How can we make sure that um, other people are, are providing child care to us are being safe to our children? Especially, you know, in our communi communi uh, refugee community, you know that they tend to, a family tends to share child care, it depends with um, schedules they switch around. So, but they do scare of those things. They, they don't understand that how I may I be safe, but my neighbor who's watching my child may I not be safe. How can I keep my child safe? How can I make sure when my child is safe? How am I making sure that these early learning are actually cleaning and keeping the children the six feet that we are talking about? So this is actually a question that we do ask the early learning to help us with. You have to call them and be informative of what they actually providing, encourage the mothers to attend the house, opening houses because that's where they talk about the overall of what they're doing so they can be actually feeling safe for themselves. So that's the most question. And then all those questions also you ask that they've been, you put here on the slide before. Yes, they do ask if it's okay for my child to be vaccinated. Is it safe to take them to the hospital? 
um, how safe it, are they in a hospital also, things like that. Maybe I may go to the, um, to the, the pediatrician by the time I come back, I did uh, carry COVID-19. Then I pass it out to my child. So how, how do I know it's safe enough? So we do uh, call, we do have um, uh, what we call uh, group connections within uh, WebEx where we actually have to ask those questions to uh, providers and then let us know how they do in majority of social distancing and how can I, can I usually um, let the kids come or, or the parents also can they get their yearly checkup? Can I, uh, when I feel sick, can I go to the doctor? Those are the questions they ask every single day that we do have to make sure we repeat and ensure them that the hospital is safe. Just like the doctor just told us, Dr. Ren just told us in a minute ago, the slide that you just showed, those question comes every single day. Then we so have to ask- How are the families doing? How are they coping? Uh, are, are any folks losing their jobs? Are they uh, in need of anything? Are you seeing any increase in uh, mental health issues? How are our families doing? Our families are doing uh, actually are pretty well than I. Um, actually, they're doing pretty well than I thought, actually. But when all this started was when things were really worse, when parents was worrying about going to work, when they already know that within the workplace there was someone who actually had the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, yes, they really had some families who lost their job because they had to stay at home, um, giving childcare to their kids who are actually out of school right now, which is going to be a, is actually a bigger issue now that um, all the kids at home doing a virtual classes. And then you remember that um, some early kids, some underage kids, especially pre-K uh, students also will be at home doing virtually classes. This is going to be a lot of parents who are actually going to be out of work than what it is right now because they're providing childcare. I'm not able to afford my child to be um, out there. Actually, you still have to be at home for if they're going to be virtual classes for the younger one, especially the kindergartners, the first graders, they still need their mother attention. Yes, they are losing their job because there's no other way. Um, as you know, that's when the resources kicks in around your community, what's out there, how can they help them with the housing, and any other thing that's out there. Yes, they are coping well, but when it gets to jobs is where things are really not going so well. So that, that is really true around the country. I read several articles recently where a lot of women um, of all economic um, stages and ages are making a decision to stay home and, stay home. Yeah, and, and quit their jobs. It, do you really? Even us as working moms, it's really hard for us to even imagine. I have three on my own. They have to do virtual classes in the morning. I'm at home working. Can you imagine? Imagine I am even lucky enough to be at home working. So can you imagine what our families, other families that we work with that are not able to be at home to do this? How hard this can be for them? Um, we don't have answers yet. I wish someone can give us answers to that, but it is not, um, we're waiting for Robert, you know you always give us uh, those juicy resources around the community, so we are waiting to see what comes out of this and what help will be there, but yeah. That really was my last question. What kinds of supports do you think the community can uh, uh, provide to families? What would you like to see more of in order to support some of the families you work with? If there were any help um, with, I can't say child care, this would be like providing help for families with working moms, single moms who are not able to afford, um, to afford anyone to watch their kids. What help can, the help you can give us is open centers that can allow the, those uh, pre-K, those kindergarten, second graders to attain and be able to do their virtual classes. That's the help we are looking for. I know it's a really hard thing to ask right now, but that's the only the help they need. They want to see centers open to help them, um, help the kids who are virtually at home. So I don't know, but if you get, if you get one, please help us. 
I will be number one to provide all the referrals you need. <laughs> well, I know that you are out there because I've come to you for resources. And um, I know that you share a lot with your families and we want to continue to support you in, in your work and, and working with families. So this is really a great segue into talking to our next panelists. And we'll get back with you in a few minutes to ask you some additional questions. But thank you. Thank you. So our, to talk. <laughs> uh -huh, that was great. Um, so our next uh, panelists are actually going to talk to us a little bit about child care and uh, what they are doing to keep children safe and what their child care program looks like. And it gives me a really great pleasure to introduce again some fairly new friends, Alexandra and David Cesar, who um, are directors of the Giselle Learning Academy, which is located on um, Memorial College Avenue. I always want to say drive, so they taught me to say avenue, not drive. And uh, it's a center that I've gotten to know recently that has um, really been involved in working with families, not only in the center, but also in the community. So Alexandra and David, uh, we're delighted you are here. And um, we'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about Cassell Learning Academy. How did you get started and how many children you serve and a little bit about your philosophy? Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Roberta. Thank you so much for having us tonight. I am so delighted to be amongst you all tonight. Um, I am the owner director of Giselle Learning Academy located at 3900 Memorial College Avenue, Clarkston, Georgia. Our mission, uh, Giselle, is we are dedicated to making a difference in people by helping them learn, grow, and thrive in the community. Our philosophy is, um, is based on family involvement, flexibility, excellence, respect, and integrity. We started back in 2013 with an after-school program it quickly grew into a full-blown nursery, and we moved into the Clarkson location. And how many children do you serve? Um, right now, we are licensed for about 117 children. So we're quite small, and our rooms are quite small, which is very helpful. So you think that really helps in um, the ratios and keeping the, the class size small in terms of preparing for, for, uh, for COVID-19? I think it does help. Um, I did not speak out of program, the different programs that we have. So we, the program that we have, we have a nursery for infants from six weeks to 14 months old. We have a toddler program, one and twos. We have a preschool program we have a pre-K program and we have a lottery program that's partnered with Head Start and we also have an after-school program. So each of these rooms are um, small uh, in a sense. The only room that we have that's a bit larger is the lottery to pre-K program. Okay. What, who are the families that you serve? Currently, it, de it depends on it depends on the program. For mm -hmm. instance, the Lottery Heads for Blended program, 90% of our population come from the refugee population. Um, throughout the center, we have quite a large number of refugee families. But the after school program, we have a lot of DFAX um, children, um, children that come from foster care homes. And we also partner with the neighborhood um, shelters. What about Head Start? Tell us a little bit about your Head Start program. The Head Start program is income-based. The children are able to um, apply, and we only hold four- and five-year-old slots. Now, if you have a child that's three or younger, because we partner with Head Start, we are assigned a family advocate. She will take the application. If we don't have a slot for Head Start for that age group, they will place the child elsewhere nearby. So one of the things you do is help families find childcare if you can't serve them at the moment. Tell us a little bit about your um, 
your fee structure and your sliding scale, what, what income families. And if somebody comes and doesn't have a whole lot of money, as we're hearing from Nadia, who, um, how do you work with families who um, may not be able to um, afford a whole lot for child care? Um, currently, I want to say about possibly 95% of our families don't have a copay. So we take several um, grant system and we also take scholarship, we take the CAPS. And when the families come, we gather all the documents on, on their behalf and we apply all kind of funding that we can so they don't have any payment. So you have several people um, that are there at very reduced fee or sometimes no fee because of Head Start and other scholarships. Mm -hmm. Mo most families, I want to say maybe 5% have a small fee, but most of them, they don't have a fee. So that will help Nadia and her families who are looking for um, uh, child care that is um, reasonable or even free. Um, Tell us a little bit about your, the quality of your program. Do you have any, are you licensed? Are you quality rated? Tell us a little bit about how you are viewed by the, by the public. Uh, at this time, we, are, we ro rose from one star program to a three star program recently. And what does that mean? With <laughs> three star quality program, it means it's the highest rating from early learning department of, in Georgia. And it took us about five years to get it. And we also have a licensed preschool, which is licensed through GAC. And so your teachers, do they have degrees? Do they have training? What kind of professional development do you do? The teachers are required to have a minimum of a CDA. However, we have teachers with master's degrees and we have teachers with um, license, teaching license. They have a bachelor in early childhood education and they also have a teaching license. And we have a couple of them right now. Due to COVID, the state waived the CDA fee and they got into the program. They're on their way to getting their CDA. So you really is the, people mm -hmm. to get professional development. Yes, it's a requirement. So what, what languages are spoken at your center? Do you have teachers that speak different languages and do you have families that speak different languages? Yes, we do. Uh, we are a multi-diverse um, center. Our student body shows it and our staff also shows it. So we do need translators and it's really um, convenient to have them in-house. We have teachers from all over. They reflect the students that we have at the center. And sometimes some of them are parents that we hire. We have a really diverse staff as well. Um, yeah. What safeguards we've talked a lot about COVID-19 tonight right I've talked to you a little bit about your program but what safeguards are you uh, making sure are taking place in your center the Georgia decal standards okay I'm going to allow David to take that part okay um, for the safeguard but I just wanted to say we remained open throughout the pandemic um, we we did a survey and the parents that we serve, they're blue collar parents and they work in the food industry, they work um, in transportation industry and they could not telework. And for this moment, we only serve essential workers. So the parents that are not, um, do not have to work, we ask them if they could please stay home. So you're really I'm gonna, the workers mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, important workers. Yes, essential mm -hmm. workers. and it's single home moms, mm -hmm. um, parents that only have one person, one income coming in, and it, it would have been detrimental. Yeah, before we turn to David, and I, we only have about a minute or two more, but do you have any openings? So if Nadia has a family that wants to, to uh, enter your center, do you have any openings right now? I know you've been open throughout the pandemic and yeah. have in some areas. We, we have, have been open been throughout the pandemic for our population that was already enrolled. However, Lottery Pre-K is starting on Monday. And Lottery Pre-K is a free program for anyone in Georgia, as long as the child is four years old by September 1st. So we had a few openings, but as of today, unfortunately, 
we are full, but we will gladly take a wait list. So we need a wait list, which means that we need more openings and more spaces in Clarkson if you're almost full. So let's turn to David really quickly and, and talk a little, uh, just very briefly about the um, child care safeguards that you put in place. Yes, thank you so okay. much. Are you with us? Hey, Roberta, thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be able to share. Um, well, typically we know since COVID started, a lot of families um, were skeptical and they were in fear. So although some of our families chose to stay home while we were open, we've periodically conducted uh, wellness checks on them by calling them and um, letting them know that we're here for them. And um, we were able to stay open because we were successfully able to adhere to all the recommended guidelines for the from the state and uh, Center for Disease Control. So um, I know a lot of people are kind of kind of have the gist of what those requirements are, but um, we made it a point at the center to reiterate with the teachers, all of our staff, on a weekly basis as far as all of the updates. Um, we also ensure that um, while we are open, we have a plan um, which which considered which would be considered a contingency plan. So, which should we have a case? What are what are we doing? What um, so we made sure that every teacher in every classroom is um, doing their screenings throughout the day and um, with the personal hygiene throughout the day and the cleaning throughout the day. And we've also reduced our hours so that we can allow um, more of the deep cleaning being done daily. So uh, we've had success doing that and we're gonna continue doing it. And uh, we also have our plan in place, should we have a case. So um, we should be in good shape. Well, thank you. And knock on wood, you haven't had a case. So we're, uh, we, we hope that we continue that. Uh, well, thank you both, uh, Nadia and Alexandra and David for sharing um, some ideas about how you and your families are coping with COVID-19. And uh, we want to now open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, and those that have joined us. And um, Ashley, you want to start with talking about the, uh, the book and uh, get feedback on the book and maybe some ideas about how we might disseminate it. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I think, you know, if anyone, um, any of the attendees had as Roberta said, any feedback about the content, the questions and answers that were um, posed um, and wanna share that feedback, we would welcome that. So I'll pause in a minute and see if anyone has any feedback. And then um, just to reiterate your point, Roberta, what we're really thinking about now is how to disseminate it. So we do have um, some print versions. So they actually look like a flip book. Um, so we have hard copy versions. We also have an electronic version that I can share with attendees from tonight. Um, so we're also looking for feedback from folks about the best way to get these flip books out to the community. Um, you know, so to, to certain organizations, um, how to reach people, say at apartment complexes, you know, where they live, where they work, um, so we're still in the process of brainstorming and we'll come and put about that as well. So I'll just pause for a few minutes and feel free to chime in. Um, and then you could also put anything in the chat. Um, Erica or Linda, I don't know if, um, I know you guys have been monitoring the chat, so feel free to chime in if there is anything you wanted to, to bring to our attention from the chat box. Hey, Ashley, this is Erica. There were two questions asked um, early during the first panelist, Dr. Bowden, 
Um, one was a clarifying question and it was from Kathy and it asked, did she say that there is a low rate of COVID-19 transfer among children under the age of 10? Yes, um, Dr. Bowden, did you want to answer that? I'm happy to address it as well. I'll let you take a stab at that. Took me a minute to unmute there. The difficulty, the reason that you probably got confused is because the research is a little bit confusing. Um, the early reports did not find strong evidence that the children were major, con young children under age five were major contributors to spread of COVID-19. But the recent, some recent research has shown a high amount of the virus found in children under age five under, in their nose. So it might be that they are more important contributors to the spread of COVID-19 than previously thought. So basically, once again, this gives... Um, evidence to the fact that this is a new virus and we don't know everything and we continue to learn things and new research continues to be done. The hard thing in the beginning was the schools were closed and so they couldn't do a lot of research and so now, well, now a lot of the schools are still closed but more research is being done and research from other countries too. So um, it's really, and Ashley, if you want to speak to it as well, but it's, it's, um, it's been just a little bit controversial and hard to really nail down an answer to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the research that I have read, um, I think, you know, there are, this is a, a research question that's difficult to measure. Um, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. So that limits the data that we have. Um, the recent CDC report does suggest that children are less likely to have severe illness. So their hospitalization rate is lower and their death rate is lower. Um, the study that Dr. Bowden mentioned about the, what we call the viral load in the nose and the nostrils, um, that's an important piece of information, but also doesn't tell us about their rate of transmission to other children and to other adults. All we know is that they have the virus and that the viral load is the same as an adult. Um, but I've seen some scientists suggest that they may be less likely to transmit um, in part because, for example, when children exhale or sneeze, it's not as powerful as an adult um, just because their bodies are little. Um, and so, you know, we're again, to, to Dr. Bowden's point, there's um, the evidence is, um, I wouldn't say contradictory. There's just, um, we're just still learning, you know, but in my, in my sense, um, collectively looking at all of the data that we have thus far, it does seem that children under five seem to be less likely to um, be um, to contract COVID and may be less likely to transmit COVID and are certainly less likely to be hospitalized um, and die from COVID. Um, so those data are reassuring. Great, thank you for that explanation. I have um, three more questions for you all. The next is, the recent death of a child in Georgia was attributed to a febrile seizure. The febrile seizure risk is higher with viral infections. Can you speak about appropriate antipyretic drugs for children and advice for parents and providers to avoid acetaminophen toxicity? Sorry, that was a long... <laughs> Long question. So we, we do recommend using acetaminophen for children when they have a fever. Um, if they take it in appropriate doses every four hours, um, they should not be getting toxicity from it. Um, it's very unfortunate about the child who died. I don't know all the details. It sounds like maybe they're still gathering details, but um, um, yeah, the, it is okay to give the acetaminophen to children um, when they have a fever. So I don't know if that answers the question. 
Okay, thank you so much for that response. Um, the next question was, within a preschool, how many students should be within a pre-K classroom and is it still, and it still be a safe environment? So this is looking at how many students should be in a classroom for it to, to be safe. So Alex or David, do you wanna? Yes, I can say this one. So uh, we just had a, um, a webinar with the commissioner and with the governor about providers. Uh, currently, the ratio for pre-K remains the same. However, they had um, some training with the teachers and I was part of that training. They do not want large groups, so they want the teachers and the assistant teachers to break down the group into cohorts smaller groups and remain with those groups just to um, prevent any transmission or in case they have a, a case of COVID and they have to isolate those children, uh, we can trace back. So how many children in, in, a, in a cohort? How many children does um, one? They recommend between five to 10 children per one teacher and that they move throughout the room. Thankfully, um, well, our our room is pretty good, pretty big for the for the pre-K room. So I'm not sure how other providers are doing it, the ones that are doing in person for pre-K. So you're separating them into two cohorts in a big room. So about five children. Five. They they are recommending that's what we do. That we um, this is the new guidelines for us for lottery pre-K guidelines. Is, a, is the only room that I have that's a pretty big room. My all room rooms are small, but I, for other providers, I'm not quite sure what they are doing. However, we are following um, early um, learning um, right from the start guideline and the CDC guideline and the train that we had. They want all the classroom lottery pre-K to have cohorts moving forward. So for instance, chronological awareness group, large group, story time group, the, the children typically sit together. Um, this time around this year, due to COVID, we will split the group. And my teachers had to do additional training because it was kind of hard to, um, for them to implement that concept. They are so used to doing large group, morning circle time. And the children, that's gonna be hard for them. But we kind of maneuver and you know, we came to a consensus. So you have to be flexible and make sure that, um, your group, you stay with the group throughout the year. That's what they're recommending. Thank you for that explanation. We have one more question in the chat and it is, since children are normally required to have updated immunization records, how do you feel about requesting mandatory testing before returning to school? Yes, um, the guidelines that we had received from last week, again, the guidelines change all the time. If a child gets get tested positive for COVID, they need to remain isolated home for 14 days. Upon returning, it was required that they do have a, t a negative test. As of right now, if they previously had a positive test, and they isolate home for 14 days upon returning, as long as they have no symptoms, no fever, um, they, are, they are able to return to school after the 14 days. But it's up to the provider if they want to require additional guidelines. For instance, we have a pretty strict guideline at the school. Even their shoes require two pair of shoes. One pair of shoes for indoors, one pair of shoes for outdoors, and nobody's allowed in the building. Um, it's up, it's really up to the providers if they want to implement the basic of what was um, handed to them or if they want to step it up a notch. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if maybe Dr. Bowden, you want to weigh in on this um, and or Dr. Reines, when if you're still on. Um, I mean, in terms of requiring a test um, for healthy asymptomatic kids before returning to school um, as opposed to what you just addressed Alexandra about someone who was positive and returning. Um, it seems to me that that is not 
necessarily an effective strategy. Um, I'm just thinking about the recent case with the summer camp um, in North Georgia and all those kids were required to have a negative COVID test before they were allowed to go to the camp. Um, but, but they required the test to be within two weeks of attending the camp. So clearly you can get a negative test and then at some point in the next week or two, you have, you're exposed and then you go to school or to camp. It doesn't seem to me that a negative test and then a one or two week delay is important or effective um, information <laughs> um, if people are not quarantining in that time, um, which clearly was not occurring with the summer camp. So I don't know, that's um, something for one of our pediatricians to weigh in on, but it seems to me that um, getting testing healthy kids before return to school, especially if there is any delay between that positive or that negative test and school or camp re-entry, that that is not that useful of, of information. I agree with that, that it does not seem <clears throat> helpful to get um, just overriding testing for every child going to a school to be negative. That does not seem to be effective. I'm wondering if there are any of our participants who have either, not necessarily a, a question, but a comment or a resource. Uh, I see Angela Moore up there. Uh, who, uh, operates a, uh, among uh, her other tasks, uh, an early learning program. If anybody would like to weigh in and share a resource or something you're doing, um, this would be a great time to share or a comment. Hi, Roberta. Thank you for, um, for acknowledging my presence. And I want to thank you for this, this webinar. It's been quite, quite um, helpful, uh, a wonderful resource for all of us in childcare. Um, I do represent the Clarkston First Baptist Academy, and we, as um, Alexander was saying, we have been able to maintain, um, man, I'm sorry, we've been able to stay open throughout the entire pandemic, and I think that's mainly because we've been very strict with our guidelines, following CDC guidelines, doing the extra cleaning, um, doing the, the, the temperature checks upon arrival for everyone, only allowing parents preferably one parent only into the center. We're doing the shoe thing as well, you no know, two pair of shoes here and just extra cleaning, extra sanitation, extra hygiene, and that's really kept us really, really safe. Um, I think that's the key thing. The, the, I want, do want to reflect my thoughts on that last question. Um, when it comes to, we have not had any positive cases. Yay! Yay! No, no parents, no teachers, no children, no nothing. Um, we did have one parent who um, did get tested because she kept running a 99 degree temperature for two days in a row. And, and we, when we have any temperature, we don't wait to 99.5. CDC says 99.5, don't let the, the parent in. We stop at 99 and we don't allow the child or the parent into the center until they've gotten some clear explanation as to what's causing that, that parent temperature because the parent is home, child's home with the parent. So we all get, we've been very cautious, uh, very careful, and um, we've gotten great results. Some children are slowly starting to return, very slowly starting to return. And we're just gonna maintain our strict guidelines, but uh, we're not requiring any testing of anyone. Uh, we make a suggestion as we did with that particular parent who had no explanation for a 99 degree temperature for two consecutive days, but it was, it's up to them. But we're not keeping anyone out. Uh, we're not requiring any testing, unless we end there's a fever and some symptoms, but we've not had anything other than that one parent who had a 99 degree temperature and she was negative. But do you have any openings? We do have openings and I also have, I'm looking for um, some new childcare um, teachers as well. We've had a big influx, a, a big fluctuation in our staff. We've had some staff to move and some who decided they don't, they no longer want to be in child care um, because of the fear. And so I do have openings for all ages. Um, from, that's from newborns up to age five. And I'm also looking for some great part-time and full-time workers too. Angela, I'm wondering, this is Ashley Owen-Smith and I see that there are also some other um, 
child care center um, staff and directors from this GSU child development center on the call as well. And I'm wondering if, if any of you guys want to weigh in on this. Um, I'm just wondering about your experiences having stayed open this whole time and, and Alexandra, you and David too, kind of what your experiences have been with the staff and how you have helped the staff kind of negotiate their stress and anxiety and kind of taking care of their own mental health through this. I know a lot of childcare providers rightfully feel nervous. Um, yes. And so I just wonder if anybody would like to comment on how, how you helped your staff get through this. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll respond to that first. You don't mind this time. I just finished talking. The first thing we did was the, to have a session. We, we kept our staff updated on all the latest information that we received from CDC and from DECAL. We made sure they were well informed. We provided resources, information to them. We made sure that they knew that they could ask any questions. They could share any fears, or any concerns. If anyone felt uncomfortable or unsafe, we gave them the opportunity to you know, not work for a while. We even changed our, our staff working hours. We switched to six hour days and divided the staff into half, half in the morning and half in the afternoon. And that really worked well because it gave the staff some free time to be home and to just kind of relax a little bit. Uh, we did notice some tension when students start to return. There was some tension, staff even expressed the concern that, well, I'm okay because I've got these same children who've been here this entire time, but I'm a little uncomfortable as new people come in. And so we made sure that we, they gave extra time off. I actually, um, we are a Christian school. We actually prayed together for those who need it. So we became um, um, even more sensitive to listening to what their general conversations were, just to see you know, what they were concerned about in case they didn't share it with us. Um, again, we allowed them, if they felt they needed to take some time off, we allowed that. We actually um, paid them a little bit more where we could to give them um, a hazard pay, um, those kinds of things. And I think that has helped the morale of our staff um, a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if you guys would give me a minute just to ask a question, even though I'm a panelist, but I work with parents with a lot of questions. Um, some of them are asking for the early learning, especially the Giselle Academy. We have a lot of parents that goes to your program and they were kind of asking question like, uh, how are you doing your open house for the new student? That was the um, first question. And the second question is, if you find out that one of your, a lot of people don't, they are not symptomatic. They may walk around with COVID-19 without knowing it. So for you to keep everybody self within the building, what are you? What are your measures you taking for the parents not to get well, in? Let me talk about the open house. Okay. Okay, I'll take the question about the open house, and David will take the question about the safety guidelines. Um, for the open house, we're going to have a drive-through contactless open house, just like we had a pre lottery pre-K graduation drive-through contactless as well. Uh, we wanted to give the the students some closure in May. It worked really well. So we decided if we have new parents coming in the building, it's so nerve wracking. To leave your child in the building, you cannot enter the building. You cannot see the room. Um, you cannot see the teachers. So we decided to have a drive, drive we have a roundabout. They're going to do a roundabout open house tomorrow actually. And the teachers were typically were, were, were outside with our mask and our gloves and we will put the package that we're supposed to give them for orientation in the package inside their cars. And they, they can see the teachers and wave and the, um, the kids can also come and wave as well. But they get to see the teachers or put the window down and you know say hi, I'm, I'm Miss, Mrs. Lullaby. I'm gonna be a child's teacher this year at six feet distance. Um, and we also uh, came up, one of my staff came up with an idea. They cannot see this, although they're gonna have the schedule, they're gonna have, um, you know, all the documentation, the newsletter and th things of that nature. Uh, we are going to do uh, a Zoom for them. I think it's through 
WebEx or something else. So you can kind of like a virtual tour. We had virtual tour before, but this time it's going to be a virtual tour just to digest the lottery pre-K um, um, goals that we're going to meet with those children and what other guidelines parents need to follow and what are the rules and regulation. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna work well. And while I'm in this topic, I wanna thank Roberta. We're going to also have a contactless drive-through back to school backpack um, giveaway tomorrow as well. We had a food giveaway with Coco Mat. It went the same way. We had a pizza giveaway for like two months. It went well. We also had a census early li literacy packet giveaway, same manner, and it went well. Um, but before David answered the, uh, the second question, um, you know, as, as I said before, I work with refugee families who are also literate in their own language mm -hmm. and cannot use technology very well. Mm -hmm. What form of communication or what form of how, um, open house are you doing for those parents? Because for sure that they're not able to communicate, also making contact with schools. I know they do registration. Some of them are, we are the one who do registration for them. So how are you keeping contact with parents that are not able to use technology? Okay. This is the reason why we had the choice of doing three settings, hybrid, full distance, or just traditional. We decided as an organization to do traditional because of our community. We want to support the community. We're there for a reason, not for a season. And those children, they need the social emotional development. And because we have so many barriers and we know language is the biggest one in our community. We have translators. And as a matter of fact, all of my new families, we have spoken to all of them already. Okay. So but we're gonna have to wrap in, up. Um, and I think that we can um, have some of this offline. Um, so Ashley, you wanna close us out? Sure, yeah, uh, Linda, I know she was gonna put up the last couple slides. Um, we just wanted to, uh, let's see, that's, that's the link for the decal guidelines um, for childcare settings. And then Linda, the next slide, Roberta and I just wanted to, um, the next one after that, thank our panelists, of course, and also to thank our sponsors, the Prevention Research Center at Georgia State and the City of Clarkston and the School of Public Health um, and CDF Action. And a special thanks to Erica and Linda for all of their administrative and technological assistance. Um, and Linda, on the next slide, I just want to share with everyone um, just for more information, we have both Roberta and I have our websites there. Um, the, the Prevention Research Center, we have a page dedicated to resources related to COVID-19 um, and um, Roberta has provided CDF Action's um, email address for more information. So please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we hope we can continue this conversation offline. Um, and so please do uh, reach out if you need to or would like to have more information and just a special thanks to all of our panelists for tonight for helping to um, Enhance this conversation and for really making this possible. We really appreciate appreciate it. So thank you all Sorry, we um, had to cut you off, but we um, if you'd like to talk further, please call us. Thanks again to everybody Thank, thank you. you so much for having us Thank you for giving us the opportunity to attend today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.